Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the workshop here. Sorry I wasn't here last night. I totally blanked out. And I was in Rome with the Holy Father. And uh, I thought that excused my work. But no, I got in about 8 o'clock last night, and I went to the hotel and um, totally blanked out. Didn't even come over. So that's the first time in a number of years that I've ever done that. So let's go ahead and begin with prayer. I'm glad that you uh, decided to come in here. It's nice and cool in here. And uh, we're going to be talking today about acts like it's seven seven keys to imitating Jesus. And this is very much along the lines of uh, discipleship and what it means to follow Christ uh, in a modern setting, which is what is really on my heart in the last year or so, is what, what does it mean to be a modern day disciple of Jesus. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you today for giving us this opportunity to come together and to, to really sit at your feet, Lord, and learn from you and your example. We pray, Lord, that as a result of this talk, as a result of this conference here in Steubenville, that we would grow closer to you and that our lives would, would reflect you and that we would bear fruit in our daily living. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I want to, uh, I want to talk to you this afternoon about uh, imitating Jesus. And we come up with seven things that we can talk about, about imitating Christ and the way he lives. The truth is we could probably come up with a hundred different things. But hopefully these seven that I have chosen will make a difference in in your life. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a little bit of it uh, tomorrow night, but I'm curious, how many of you will be at the Defending the Faith conference? Okay, so probably what, about half of you? Something like that, a third to half of you? Very good. When When it comes to learning about the faith and coming to a conference like this, it is so good because you get to go to so many workshops and there's keynote addresses that follow a theme and you can take notes, you can get the CDs, you can get the videos, whatever. And you gather that information together. And it becomes a part of your library. Maybe you bought some books. Uh, maybe you got some CDs, whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, what really matters is not what you buy. And what really matters is not what you listen to. But what really matters is how you take that information and incorporate it into a real life, a real daily life of walking with Christ, and that everything that we are learning should make a difference in our lives when it comes to our marriage, when it comes to our prayer time, when it comes to raising children, when it comes to working, when it comes to your own health, your emotions, uh, career choices, all of this. What we learn makes a difference in our lives. And to be a, a disciple of Jesus literally take, means to take everything and focus it, everything, on that one point of imitating him and following him as a modern-day disciple. Whatever you buy, whatever you view, the news you watch, the way you take care of yourself, what you eat, everything has a focal point as a disciple to glorify God and to serve him. And that's what really makes life incredibly exciting. Now, I got seven points that I want to share with you in this workshop, and and we're going to end a a little bit early so that we can take some questions, hopefully. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to to ask those, and I will pass those on to Scott. (laughs) So the first point that I want to share with you when it comes to uh, acts like it, become a modern-day disciple of the Lord, the very first thing that we have to determine is that we are not going to be simply fans of Jesus, but we are going to be followers of Jesus. There is a huge difference between being a fan of Jesus and a follower of Jesus. And becoming a fan of Jesus is something that is actually easy to do. Now, you all here are uber Catholics. Now, an uber Catholic is someone who goes to a small town in Ohio on a Thursday and studies the Bible. That's an uber Catholic. You're a little weird. 
okay? You're different than the rest, right? You're an uber Catholic. But one of the major problems that we can experience as major uber Catholics like yourself and myself is that we can exchange the dynamic following of Jesus Christ, that is spending time with him on a daily basis, listening for his voice, looking for opportunities to be Christ in the world, looking for opportunities to solve problems. We can exchange all of that dynamic life for simply studying the faith. In other words, we we put it another way, your faith, if you don't watch it, can become your hobby. It becomes your hobby. You're really into this stuff, you know? I love going to Steubenville, love getting the books, love watching EWTN. And if someone asked me, am I Catholic? I would probably answer, yeah, I'm Catholic. You know, I watch EWTN. I listen to Catholic radio. I've got all these CDs and I've got all of Scott Hahn's books and I got a fish on my bumper sticker. Okay. (laughs) I'm Catholic. But that doesn't mean that I'm really Catholic. It just means I consume a lot of things. I am a fan. And so you can follow Jesus for years as a fan and never become a follower. One who imitates, one who walks in his footsteps to where people look at what you say, they listen, they watch what you do, they look at your family, they hear you in private, and they come to the conclusion, you must belong to Jesus. So people are not going to know that we are followers of Jesus Christ if they don't see it in action. They're not going to know that we're followers with Christ simply by the books that we read and that that type of thing. You know, I I could go on television with cable these days and and I could could watch show after show about deer hunting, elk hunting, fishing, big game adventure in Africa, guns and ammo, and every other kind of show. And I could do that for 20 years and never shoot a gun or go hunting. And yet people listening to me talk would say, man, does that guy know guns. Man, does he know hunting. Never been. But I can talk circles around you when it comes to hunting or when it comes to guns or whatever it might be. Now, that can be true of of knitting. I could be studying knitting for 10 years and tell you everything about Knit One, Pearl Two, and everything else, and never knit a a garment in my life. So the point is, is that if we're going to be imitators of Jesus, we have to get beyond the fan stage into the following stage, where we are actively, every day, we are disciples of the Lord and putting what we're learning into practice. Simply put, if we are not putting into practice daily something, if we're not aware of what is happening in our spiritual life, we have to ask ourselves if we really are following him. Or do we just dip into our spiritual life occasionally and read a book or listen to the radio and then go back to kind of a, but we don't actually do it. Jesus was not a fan When Jesus came to earth, he said, I do what I see my father doing. I say what I hear my father say. In other words, he was continually engaged as a follower in the sense of his father. He was following the example of his father. He said, I don't speak on my own. I am telling you what my father is saying. I'm doing what I see my father do. In the same way, As Catholics in the modern setting, we should be able to say every day of our lives, I am doing today what I see my Lord doing. And I'm saying in my conversations what I'm hearing my Lord saying in that particular situation. So we truly become modern disciples of the Lord. And I got to tell you that uh, I have found that there is a difference between those who are active in being a disciple, and those who are active just in study. That those who are active in being a discipleship, that is, they are putting what they study into practice, they live a dynamic, fruitful life that is ever-changing every single day. 
And I, I, can, I can say to you that, that that's, the, that's the type of life I want to live, where I get up in the morning and every day is a great adventure, uh, besides the Bible study. Everything, <laughs> everything is a great adventure. Everything is following Jesus. And every opportunity, every room I go into is an opportunity to allow Christ to live through me. So number one, if we're going to be imitators of Jesus, we have to be like Jesus, and that is we cannot simply be fans. Jesus never walked around and said, I'm a fan of my father. Everybody, I'm a fan of my father. Such a fan, such a fan. He never would have said that. He is a follower, and he followed everything his father said and everything his father did. So that's something that we have to answer in our lives if we're going to be modern-day authentic disciples. Number two is that we need to be wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly given over to what is called the yoke, Y-O-K-E, the yoke of Jesus. The yoke of Jesus. Now, what do we mean by this? If we're going to be modern-day disciples of the Lord, and we're going to act like it, okay, <laughs> we have to have some agenda. Uh, we have to have some idea of what is right, what is wrong, what is holy, and what is not holy, what is common. We have to have some idea on this mission as we live this on a daily basis of being the body of Christ, which we're going to mention in a moment. We have to have some idea of what his will is. Now, it's one thing to learn everything theological. We've got it all figured out as far as the church goes. We got it all figured out as far as end times. We, uh, we understand the sacraments. We understand heaven, hell, and purgatory. We understand mortal sin and venial sin and the communion of saints. We've got this down. We studied it, and we, we can repeat it to other people. We can debate even. But that is very, very different than knowing his heart and his plan. In paragraph 236 of the Catechism, which has become incredibly important for me in my life, paragraph 236 of the Catechism brings out two aspects that all of us need to know desperately if we're going to understand his yoke. Now, I'll get to that in just a moment. Let's get back to yoke just for a second. In Matthew chapter 11, in verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then in verse 29, he says something that you may think he made up, but he didn't. All the rabbis said it in the first century. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. Okay? When, when, when a rabbi in the first century, Jesus, the rabbi of rabbis, says, take my yoke upon you, what it means is, take my world view upon you. Okay? See life the way I see life. The modern day disciple of Jesus is one who understands his worldview. The modern day disciple of Jesus, as a result of massive amounts of time together, understands what he would say. They understand the position he would take. They clearly get how he would treat someone in a given situation. They know him. Not only do they know what he would do, but they know how he would do it. And how does that come about? Not by reading books. It comes about by standing with him, walking with him, praying with him, being with him year after year after year until you know him so well that you begin imitating him and doing exactly what he does. It's like being an apprentice. Okay? So to take the yoke of Jesus is to say, yes, I am going to do what you do. I'm going to think the way you think. I'm going to act the way you act. I'm going to take your yoke upon me. That is my goal as a modern-day disciple. I'm going to take that on as a father. I'm going to take that on as a husband. And every time I come home from work at the end of the day, I can ask myself, is this the way Jesus would behave with his children? Is this the way Jesus would greet his wife, which he has one, us? 
True story, my, my daughter, who graduated from Steubenville here back in 2004, she came up to me one time when she was in second grade, and she taps me. She says, Daddy? And I said, yeah. She said, Jesus didn't get married, did he? And I said, no. She said, but, but if he had gotten married, just imagine what kind of wife he would have had. And I said, well, I can describe that wife to you. She, you can? Yes. I said, honey, you and me. We're the ones that he chose. We're the bride of Christ. And so how would Jesus treat his bride? How should you treat your bride? This is all a part of being a disciple of Jesus. And the, the thing that I can't, re, I can't reiterate it enough, the thing that we have to break out of is just settling for knowing the right answer. We've got to move into the practicum, the doing of it. And so... In any situation that I, I place you in, or Jesus places you in, or God the Father places you in, you would know what to do in that situation. And that just comes in time because you've been with him so much. Now, back to paragraph 236. Par paragraph 236 of the Catechism says that there are two things that we need to know. One, the theologia, theology, number one. Number two, oikonomia, the economy of God. Those are two big fancy words, the theology and the economy. But then paragraph 236 breaks that down a little bit, and it tells you what that means. Theology is for you to come to know the mystery of the Trinity. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The love between them is the Holy Spirit. It's a dynamo of love and family. Okay? Break it down even more. Theology, that you might come to know the heart of your Father. That you would come to know the heart of your heavenly Father. You know his heart. You can depend upon him. You know what he will do. You know that he will be there when you praise him, when you call upon him in the time of need. You know that he will not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to know that heart of my heavenly Father comes through prayer, it comes through Bible study, it comes through living a sacramental life, it comes from living in the community. But the second thing in the paragraph is, number one, knowing the heart of my Father, which is what Bible study is about. The second is the economy, and the word oikonomia, back in Jesus' day, was a term that, that described a father's household plan, the economy of the house. The economy. So it, it, today we think of it as money. You know, Motley Fools, MSNBC, the whole thing. But back then, the economy meant your father's plan for you, for his house. And so when we say, yes, Lord, I will be your disciple, because that's only by invitation. We're going to learn about that on uh, tomorrow night. It's only by invitation. You cannot be the disciple of a great rabbi on your own initiative. You cannot do it. It is impossible. It is an inv invitation, come follow me. And once you've done that, the rabbi will say, take my yoke upon you and follow me. And at that point, at that point, you are focused on knowing his heart and knowing his plan. And that's what comes from Bible study and prayer, holy hours, mass, and fellowship in the body of Christ and studying the saints and all the, all the good things that we have. You can come to know. So when I'm teaching, and I know a lot of you are teachers, your DREs and, and catechists, uh, I, I can encourage you today, you know, in your teaching, and if you're parents or grandparents, is that in all of your teaching that you do, everything that you're sharing with people, whether it be students, children, or grandchildren, I've got two little grandchildren, two boys, Francis and Dominic. They don't get along still, but... <laughs> But everything, everything I do with them, everything that I do with my students when I teach at the seminary in the Twin Cities with the Catechetical Institute and so forth, always has those two things in mind. His heart, I want my students to know his heart. And I want my students to know his plan. I want my students to know his yoke. 
Because Jesus finally ended Matthew 28 and he said, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I commanded. And I I can break it down into those two things. I want you to know his heart. I want you to know his plan. Why grandson? Why student? Why friend? Because I want you to trust him. I want you to trust him as a disciple and do what he calls you to do. But if you don't know his heart and you don't know his plans, who are you going to trust? And what are you going to trust? And I think a lot of people, to be honest with you, and this isn't geared towards you, but I mean just in general, a lot of people don't trust God. You know why? They don't know him. They don't know his heart and they don't know his plan. They don't know him. And so this becomes really, really important for us to take on his yoke. Now, the problem with this that we're facing is this. And I'm being nice. More Catholics in America probably know more about the yoke of Dr. Phil than they do Jesus. More Americans in America or Catholics, I should say, know more about the yoke of Ellen than they do Jesus. It's very true, actually. But here's the problem. Dr. Phil and Ellen don't have a plan for you that works. They don't have a heart for you individually. In fact, you can't get to them. But Jesus, who has a plan... And Jesus, who has a heart for you, is giving you full access to become his disciple and to follow him. And one of the problems that we face is that as we leave these doors and we leave this conference saying yes to the yoke of Jesus as a disciple, is that we're going to go right back to our parish and run smack into an opposing yoke of some DRE or somebody else who knows more about Oprah than Jesus. And we're going to get frustrated, right? That's why we have to know Jesus and live that out and let this life become attractive, addictive. And I'm a, a firm believer that those that live the life of Jesus openly and they live it with a dynamism and love, it's attractive. It's attractive. That's why Mother Teresa, who owned nothing, who really didn't have anything special in terms of great skills that drew the world's attention. She just did the basics of what a disciple does, and she won the Nobel Peace Prize. That at some level, the people in the world said, that's cool. That's cool. Cool is Greek for fantastic. (laughs) So don't don't write that down. She writing that? That was just a joke. So (laughs) number one, what do we do, number one? We need to make a determination that we're going to be a follower. We're not going to stick with just being fans. We're going to be a follower. We're not going to go and just show up at Caesarea when Jesus is in town or when he comes to Bethlehem. We're going to buy a ticket for a couple of talks. That's not what what we're about. We're going to be be followers. We're going to go with him everywhere. Once Once we hear that invitation, come follow me, we're going to say yes. Number two, we want to wholeheartedly take Jesus' yoke upon ourselves. Now, I mentioned that we want to take his yoke, his worldview, his heart, his plan, into our own lives. And here's an example, uh, kind of an experiment that you can do. Uh, When you say yes to his yoke, one of the things that you can do, which I so like doing myself, is make your heart a project. Make your heart a project. What do I mean by that? Do you have any idea what kind of progress you have made over the last five years? Are you aware, actively, consciously, are you aware over over the last 20 years, say, so how many of you have been walking with Jesus for 20 years? Okay. Are you aware of the progress that you have made in your heart? This is one of those interesting things that I, I, find, I find fascinating when I talk to people, including at times myself, 
which I do talk to myself sometimes, but, and, and that is, are you aware of the condition of your heart 20 years ago versus today? Have you made progress when it comes to vices? Have you changed in your response to people when you find out that your, for example, sister has been financially blessed beyond all measure? And 20 years ago, you would have been envious. Today, are you still envious? You know, when Christmas cards come out, it's a great time for envy. You know, that envy is when you become sad at someone else's blessing. Jealousy is, I want what you have. Envy is, I don't want you to have what you have. And when we hear that our sister is blessed, it makes us sad. Is that the way your heart still is? These Christmas cards are fantastic, aren't they, when you get them? Christmas card comes in and they go through the litany of every child and what they've been doing that year. You know what I'm talking about? Frank was accepted into the Naval Academy. Susan just graduated from MIT. Little Dolly discovered the cure to cancer. And little Billy is the scoutmaster now. You know, it's like, I hate you. Oh, P.S., paid off the cabin. <laughs> That's envy. Because <laughs> you want to write a letter back you know, that says, well, Don still has that rash they can't figure out. <laughs> you know, Bobby's still in prison and <laughs> life is tough. So how is your heart? How do you respond to other people's blessings? What about temptation in your life? Do you still struggle the exact way in that particular area as you did 20 years ago? And have you consciously worked on it? The heart of a disciple is one who is taking his yoke upon them and bit by bit starting to go after every part of the heart and improving and becoming more like Jesus. For example, I'll give you, I'll give you some ideas here. Uh, vice versus virtue. Humility. Humility. If you're a disciple of the Lord, is there ever been a time in your life where you have actively, consciously worked on humility? Well, I'm proud to tell you I have. <laughs> totally conquered it. Okay. No, humility. Is, is there really, is there ever been a time, has there been one day or a week or a month where you said, going to do that? You know, I've, I've got a, a new radio show on iTunes. For lack of a better one, it's, I'm talking about humility. It's called The Jeff Caven Show. But uh, I did, I'm the one that didn't actually name it that. My producers did. But in that show, I, I have a show that I did about three weeks ago. You can go to iTunes and listen. All practical shows, one a week, one a week. And about a couple of weeks ago, I did a show on the power of isolating spiritual disciplines. The power of isolating spiritual disciplines. You know that oftentimes uber Catholics become, as they, look, as they look at the landscape of their life and all the blessings, all the problems, all the situations, opportunities, victories and defeats, they look at it all, you know what? They get overwhelmed. They get overwhelmed and they think, how are you doing in your spiritual life? And they go, I could be doing better. That's usually the answer, isn't it? How's your prayer life? Could be better. Everything is could be better. And it's like they're overwhelmed. But here's, the, here's what I, I suggest. Like any discipline in life, if you want to get good at it, the key is to isolate the individual disciplines among the whole and not be overwhelmed by the over, overarching whole problem. So for example, if you want to be a quarterback in the NFL, you don't just go out there as a quarterback and the first day of practice and take a hike and come back like this, plant and throw a line, you know, 40 yards. It doesn't happen. The quarterbacks in the NFL practice by isolating parts of their discipline over and over and over. They practice taking hikes. Hike! Thousands and thousands of times they learn that. They get the feel of it, the cadence. They practice thousands of times. Three steps back in a plant. Probably not doing it right, but 
they, do, they, 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 they practice thousands of times reading the defense. And then there comes a time where they start putting two of them together. Two of them together, muscle memory. There is a spiritual muscle memory to a disciple's life. To where if you do something over and over and over, it's called a virtue. It's called a habit. And after a while, it just happens. It's you. You do it that way. Like, for example, if you've got a problem coming home from work, maybe there's a bunch of different problems coming home from work. Maybe when you drive home from work as a disciple, you go by some questionable places that really trip you up. Maybe you struggle with alcohol, and you keep going by that same bar on the way home. Maybe you struggle with pornography, and you go by that same theater on the way home or that, or that bookstore. Maybe you struggle with thoughts about a former girlfriend, but you continually will go down that road on the way home. And when you come home, you'll come home and you're a little bit wound up from the day's work and you get home and you forget about being a father. You forget about being a husband. You sit down, give me my remote, honey, grab my beer. I'm going to watch the news. And you're thinking, man, I wish I could be different. Well, changing all of that can be a little bit overwhelming, but why not isolate the disciplines. I'm not driving that way home anymore. And I'm going to do that for 30 days. I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going home a different way for 30 days. When I get home, the first thing out of my mouth is not where's the remote and hand me a beer, honey. Well, you go ahead with that. I'll use a different example. (laughs) That's not the first thing you say when you go home. You say, what should I say? When I go home, I want to kiss my wife. I want to give her a hug. I want to ask, is there anything I can do for you? She's probably going to look at you and wonder whether you did go home by that bar. (laughs) But when you come home and you are so kind and you are so nice, you think, hey, I did it once. No, don't do it once. Well, I'll do it for a week. No, not a week. Do it for a month. Isolate and do it. That's a disciplined follower of Christ. That's someone who's working on their heart, on their spiritual heart. It could be football. It could be anything. It could be shooting pistols. It could be, it could be um, auto mechanics. It could any discipline in life. It could be cooking in the kitchen, putting everything away. It's repetition. And in the spiritual life, when it comes to these particular uh, virtues, humility, isolate. So here's what I'm recommending. I've got a list of these virtues. I'll, I'll name them off to you here in a moment. But what I'm suggesting is this. If you really want to grow and take on his yoke, isolate 12 disciplines for the next year. Just isolate 12. Because if you isolate 12 disciplines for the next year, and this next month, every day you focus for this next month on one discipline that's going to change in my life. It's going to change. I've always wanted to pray the rosary every day. I've always wanted to go to Mass more than once a week. I have always wanted you fill in the blank. I've always wanted to be gentle with my children instead of angry when I get home. One discipline. Let's focus on that. Let's ask the Lord to help us with his heart, with his plan, and do that. In 12 months, you will have dealt with 12 major areas of behavior that you are changing in with the Lord's help. If you don't isolate and focus, my guess is in a year from now, you are basically going to be the same as you are today. And part of it is the way you were raised. Part of it is just old habits. Part of it is we're lazy. And so the disciple of the Lord is intent on the heart changing and becoming more like him, but we have to do it one bite at a time like eating the the elephant. Now here's some more of these wonderful virtues. You know, the virtue of humility. What's, uh, uh, what's What's the vice? Humility is the virtue that counters pride. Pride, right. What about liberality? Liberality or generosity. You might call it generosity. That's one of mine, by the way. I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying it's one I've conquered. It's one I'm working on. That is one of them that I have been working on, generosity. You know how it started? I'm not, I can't believe I'm telling you this. This doesn't leave the room. Okay. <laughs> Turn off the mic. I was at a restaurant, and I left a tip. And the person I was with said, man, are you cheap? 
I said, I am not cheap. I am a disciple. I am frugal. She said, no, that's not frugal. That's cheap. So I ended up hearing a couple of times people saw the tip I'm leaving, and I said, look, what is wrong with 6%? (laughs) And I started going on a 30-day, I'm going to be generous. I am going to learn to be a generous person. And I am up to 7% now. (laughs) So you keep praying. But you see what I'm saying? It's one thing. My wife said it and someone else said it. I said, you're stingy. I beg your pardon, I am not stingy. And it come to think of it, I think I am when it comes to tips. I don't get it. So I'm now in the process of leaving a bigger tip. And when I do, I tell everyone. (laughs) Which counters the whole pride one. So they they all have to work together. So then you've got, you've got liberality. Liberality or generosity is the virtue that is counter to greed. Chastity. Chastity is the counter virtue to the sin of lust. Lust. People, if you're struggling with lust in your life, isolate. What is it, that, what is it that's contributing to this in your life? Do you think you're really going to tackle lust with that complete access to HBO, you really think that's going to happen? Or do you got to make a decision? Do you have to fight? Do you have to say, that is not a good thing for my soul. It might be HBO. It might be another thing. It might be this. It might be the drive home. Uh, it might be going to cards with uh, the guys and questionable things happen. This is not good for my soul. I got to make a decision. I got to make a decision. I talked to a, a very high-powered attorney not too long ago that ended up going to a graduation party. He's a strong Catholic man. He went to a graduation party, and, and at the graduation party, all of a sudden, three strippers came in. And there he was. And you know what his friend said? Friend sitting next to him who knew he was a disciple of the Lord. I'm not even going to say Catholic or Christian. He knew he was a disciple of the Lord. You know what he said? I suppose you're going to go. And he said, you suppose right. And he got up and he left. And the guy followed him out, made a decision. This is not good for my soul. I am a disciple of the Lord. So then you have meekness. Meekness or patience is the virtue that counters the sin of unjust anger. There's good anger and there's bad anger. Good anger is anger that comes up that begs for a solution. There's been an injustice. There's been a a crime committed. Anger comes up. It's justifiable. But oftentimes anger comes up and there's no justification for other than I'm selfish. I've been inconvenienced. Anger is a good thing. Anger from the Lord has a purpose and that is to correct a wrong. But when you, there's no wrong to correct and you just have been inconvenienced, you have to deal with that anger properly. Isolate it. If you're dealing with anger, isolate it for a month. Learn about it. Read about it. Get CDs on that. And every day, practice. Practice. Don't fall into unjust anger. You've got temperance, the virtue of temperance or abstinence uh, that counters the sin of gluttony. Uh, Do you in your life, are you struggling with alcohol? Are you struggling with substance abuse right now in your life? Are you fighting it? Are you leaning on the grace of the Lord? Are you changing that in your heart by going to Jesus and saying, I'm struggling with temperance? Or do you come to the same point every time after those two drinks and say, well, it's really not going to be a problem this time? Do you got a plan? Can you take 30 days and say, I'm going to walk in a temperate way here rather than giving myself over to everything? It could be food. Don't biggie size for a month. You're not going to die. I got a biggie size. I'll die if I don't biggie size. You're not going to die, but you'll feel the satisfaction of spiritual growth when you isolate and begin to focus on those things as a disciple. Kindness. This is one that I have worked on in my life. Uh, Kindness or brotherly love, love for one's neighbor, is the virtue which counters the sin of envy. You struggling with envy? Work on kindness. Rejoice in other people's victories. Jesus put it this way, and he's, he's the one we're following. He's the one we want to know his heart and his ways. You want to know his heart in this? His heart is this. 
Rejoice with those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who mourn. That's what he teaches us. That's what he taught me. Envy turns it all upside down. I rejoice with those who mourn. And I mourn with those who rejoice. It's Satan's church. It's his M.O. And it totally scrambles what Jesus is teaching us to rejoice with those who rejoice. If you're struggling with envy, envy and it happens to be your sister, go home and just take five things, just five things that she has been blessed with and thank God for her. In fact, you might even want to write her a note or call her and say, I just want you to know I am so happy for you. She may say, well, how did that sound coming out of your mouth? Like vinegar. No. (laughs) But to actually do something about it is very, very powerful. And then you've got diligence. Diligence or persistence is the virtue which acts as a counter to the sin of sloth. Sloth. Number three, we're talking about the imitations of Jesus. Number three, uh, rooted in prayer. A disciple of the Lord, if they're going to imitate Christ, is is rooted in prayer. And I would give you this verse or this paragraph from the Catechism, in paragraph 2602, 2602, 2602, it gives us a perfect picture of Jesus in prayer. He's the model. He's constantly in prayer with the Father. He's always going away, and he's praying. He's getting the mind of his Father. He's getting the plan of his Father, and then he re-enters society with that. And that's what a disciple does on a daily basis. And so listen to this. Jesus often draws apart to pray in solitude on a mountain, preferably at night. He includes all men in his prayer, for he has taken on humanity in his incarnation, and he offers them to the Father when he offers himself. Jesus, the word who has has become flesh, shares by his human prayer in all that his brethren experience, He sympathizes with their weaknesses in order to free them. Now listen to this. It was for this that the Father sent him. His words and works, words and works, are the visible manifestation of his prayer in secret. So the purpose of prayer for the the disciple of Jesus is not simply a laundry list or not simply words that are repetitious, but we are not thinking anything about it. But the purpose for prayer is relationship. It's intimacy with God. And what we talk about, and by the way, Lexio Divina is phenomenal here. If you've never done that before, uh, Google it. <laughs> Lexio Divina is four steps. You take a little small portion of scripture. You take about five minutes to read it few minutes to meditate on it, a few minutes to pray and ask God, how does this mean in my life? What is this for? What are you saying to me? And just a few minutes to contemplate, contemplatio. So you've got lexio, meditatio, oratio, contemplatio. If you don't do those, you'll have frustratio. <laughs> okay? So you, 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 you got to take a little bit of time every day to dialogue with God in prayer, and according to the catechism, what Jesus did when he went up on the hill, what he did was manifest when he came down from the mountain. And he interacted with everybody. Everything that he was doing came out of that, that time of prayer. The time of prayer for the disciple is the anchor of the day. It's the anchor. It's the plumb line. It's the time where you learn about yourself, you get honest with yourself, you learn about God. That's humility. So rooted in prayer, and there's two prayers I highly recommend. One is Lexio Divina. The other is at the end of the day called the Examine Prayer. The Examine Prayer is a very good prayer. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an out of the Ignatian tradition. And it's just a few minutes at the end of the day that reviews the day. And that's what I was talking about earlier. A life that is not examined is not a life worth, worth living. Is that we examine our life every day. How am I doing the progress that I am making as a disciple. So that's prayer. Number four, one of the marks of a disciple is faithfulness. Faithfulness. Wow. Faithfulness. In other words, obey his word. Obey his word. 
the very first time we see this, this word faith in the Bible is in Exodus. It's in Exodus, and it's in Exodus 17 in verse 12. And in that story, Moses' hands are being raised by Aaron and Hur. And when his hands are raised steady, they win the war. But when his hands fall down, they lose. And it says in that scripture, it says the word faith, or, or it says the word um, emunah. Emunah in Hebrew, emunah, E-M-U-N-A-H, it speaks of faithfulness, pistis in Greek. And it says in Exodus 17, 12, but when Moses' hands were heavy, then they, they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. That word steady, his hands were steady until the sun set, is the word emunah, faith. So faith carries with it the connotation of long continuance, steadfast, faithfulness. The mark of a disciple of Jesus is faithfulness. Unfaithful is not a mark of a disciple. Because you have to remember as a disciple too, we're the bridegroom, we're the bride, and he's the bridegroom. You know what I mean? This is a covenant relationship with Jesus. This is not a political relationship with Jesus. It is not a social relationship with Jesus. It is a covenant bridal spousal relationship that is marked by faithfulness and unfaithfulness. And when we lose sight of what it means to be a disciple on a daily basis, we begin to describe our relationship with God in political terms. I'm conservative. Oh, I'm liberal. I'm a liberal Catholic. Oh, really? Well, you guys, I'm a moderate. I'm a moderate Catholic. Well, la di da. You're a moderate Catholic. Wow. What do they do? Whatever they want. <laughs> well, let me ask the ladies who are here if you're looking for a husband. Are you looking for a conservative? Are you looking for a moderate? Are you looking for a liberal? How many of you are saying, oh, I'm just praying right now. I got a rosary going in a novena. I'm looking for a moderate husband. <laughs> Anybody looking for a moderate husband? You know? or, or guys, your wife comes home and says, honey, you're the luckiest guy in America. Why is that, sweetie? Because I have been 98% faithful. <laughs> really? You're not happy? I mean, Susan over there, she's 64%. Barbara's 82%. And you know what her name down the street? 38% faithful. 98% faithful. How many of you husbands are going to say, I am so blessed? Or how many of you husbands are going to say, let's talk about the 2%? There's no one here praying for a moderate husband. When we lose touch with the relationship and we take it out of faithful and unfaithful, we use political terms, and God has called us to be disciples. And the measure is faithful. We took his yoke upon us, faithful and unfaithful. Those are the terms that we use. And so faithfulness is very, very important. And there are two aspects to faith in the catechism when it comes to uh, what does it mean to be faithful? What does it mean to be faithful? Or what does it mean to have faith? What does it mean? What it means is not merely believism. Like if I said, you've heard 20 fantastic talks at this conference, and you're going to hear 20 more at Defending the Faith. Did you like it? People, I loved it. Do you believe? People, I believe. Well, that's not believing. Believing is not making mental assent. In fact, it's only half of it. The catechism teaches us that when it comes to biblical faith as a disciple, it's two-part. Number one is making mental assent to a thing. It's saying, Body of Christ. The Eucharist is literally body in Christ, Christ. Soul and divinity. Totally. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. 
I believe it. Okay? That's only half. And that that's all you do, that's just called believism. Well, the devil believes, but he trembles. So we say, well, I do believe that. Well, that's only half. The second half is a personal entrusting of yourself to God. I believe that Mary is the mother of God. Number two, I entrust myself. That's biblical faith. Biblical faith is the mental ascent and the personal entrusting. Uh, The paragraphs, if you want to write them down, are paragraph 1062 and 1074. It says, uh, in Hebrew, amen comes from the same root as the word believe. This root expresses solidity, trustworthiness, faithfulness. And so we can understand why amen may express both God's faithfulness towards us and our trust in him. Verse, uh, paragraph 1064, thus the creed's final amen repeats and confirms its first words, I believe. To believe is to say amen to God's words, promises, and commandments, to entrust oneself completely to him who is the amen of infinite love. And so in paragraph 150 of the catechism, that's the one that goes into both the adherence and entrusting. And here's what it says. Faith is, first of all, a personal adherence of man to God. That's the personal entrusting. At the same time and inseparably, it is a free assent to the whole truth that God has revealed. As personal adherence to God and assent to his truth, Christian faith differs from our faith in any human person. It is right and just to entrust oneself wholly to God and to believe absolutely what he says. It would be futile and false to place such faith in a creature. So let me give you an example real quick. You might have heard this in one of my teachings, but as Peter says, it does you well to hear it again. This is a great analogy to find out. Do you really believe? Do you really walk in faith as a disciple? If you, if you went to Niagara Falls, you, you heard this before? This is a little, I've given this, I think, in a couple of teachings. But real quickly, you go to Niagara. How many of you have not heard this? Okay, you can have a barrel of fun here. Okay, you go to Niagara Falls, there's this guy, he's a tightroper, and he's walking across Niagara Falls. People are on the, North, on the New York side, people are on the Canadian side, yelling, chanting, it's fantastic. It's one of these, this family member, the Loinga family, I don't know what they call themselves. But anyway, they're gonna, he's going to walk across Niagara Falls. So the crowd is there, CNN and Fox are covering it, and he gets up there, Loenda, that's the family. And he gets up there, and he starts walking. Everyone is quiet. It takes him a half an hour, and he gets all the way across Niagara Falls to the Canadian side. He's done. The crowd goes berserk, clapping. And then the crowd starts yelling, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. And he yells out with the microphone. He said, do you think I should do it again? And they said, yes. Do you think I can do it again? They said, yes, we believe, we believe. In America, we, Canadians, believe, we believe, we believe. And together, in you. And he says, do you think I can do it again, pushing a wheelbarrow? Yes, we believe it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Do you believe I can do it again, pushing a wheelbarrow, blindfolded? Yes, we believe you think I can do it again, blindfolded, pushing a wheelbarrow with a human being in the wheelbarrow? Yes! Do it, do it, do it. We believe, we believe. I need a volunteer. (laughs) Not one. Not one person believed biblically. They all made mental assent, but no one entrusted themselves. That's biblical faith. That's the faith of a disciple. The mark of a disciple is believing, but entrusting ourselves personally to these truths and living as though we truly entrusted ourselves and believed. That's the mark of a disciple. Faith is very, very important. And then after faith, uh, there's a couple more I'm going to give here pretty quick, and then I'm going to open it up because I'm almost done with my introduction here. 
The fifth one is to love one another. The mark of a disciple clearly is to love one another. Uh, C.S. Lewis said that this was the most risky thing that God ever did. He gave the world permission to judge the incarnation on our behavior toward each other. That they would know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. We have to love one another. That is not a phileo love, which is brotherly. It's not a storge love, which is basically a mother's love for her child. It's not an eros love, which is an erotic love, or eros is also used for a passionate uh, love for collecting things like guns or boats or purses. But it is agape, willing to sacrifice ourselves for others. A friend is willing to lay down his life for others. And that's the love that marks us as Christians. And, and, and I'm afraid that sometimes we can go on and on and on with our life, learning and so forth, as we talked about earlier, and all of a sudden we realize, I'm not actively involved in loving anybody. I'm not conscious of loving you. Or opportunities come up, and I just kind of, you know, rather than entering into the moment, embracing it, and living an intentional discipleship life by loving, sacrificing myself for my family. I've had to do that many times in my life. I got three girls, and many times I've had to stop what I was doing, which was my thing, and suddenly think, I need to love. I need to love. Or I have all three girls, uh, and I'll tell you what, when you get all three girls, teenagers at the same time, uh, the things they can say to a dad... I got to love. I got to walk in love. And, and that's what we're called to do. Sometimes they get a little wild there. Love one another. John 14, 5, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And number six, live in the heart of the church. Live in the heart of the church. What do I mean by that? A disciple, one of the markings of a disciple of Jesus Christ is that they live not separate. They're not doing their own thing. They don't take Jesus to Vegas and elope. They are with the family. They're with the saints or with his mother. They live a sacramental life. They're involved in their parish. They are involved in the outreach. They are a part of a community. They pray as a family. We study as a family. We live out our faith as a family. We're not alone. At the same time, though, we have to focus on our relationship alone with the Lord at times because it's so intimate and personal with the things that we're working with. And when it's all said and done, none of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ with our parish. Your parish council won't be there. (laughs) You're saying, oh, good. (laughs) The CCD teachers won't be there. Your parish priest will not be there. Your deacons won't be there. It'll be you and God, and you will stand before God. And so we have to be cognizant of that, but we get there by living together, you know, and worshiping together and, uh, and, and all that. So uh, living in the heart of the church is study Scripture together, study the catechism, go to Mass as often as possible, and, and what I would say, too, is read smart. Within the church, if you're going to be living in the heart of the church, there's all kinds of writings of saints, and there's all kinds of books out there. Read smart. Pick a few saints that you want to go deep with. Don't feel like you got to read everything that comes down the pike, but pick maybe a couple that you want to go deep, and you want to know them. For me, it's John Paul II and St. Augustine. I want to go deep. I want to know them. They're my brothers. I want to know them really, really well. But read smart. Get my books. <laughs> Kidding. So, okay, go ahead and do it. I don't care. <laughs> but I want to share this with you on, on this point, which I think is really important. Uh, this is something I have done in my own life. Div- and this is one of the whole shows on my radio show. On the radio show, the whole show is called Who's in your posse? Develop a posse. I can't, I don't know who all the saints are. I don't know, if I had to know all the saints that John Paul II beatified, I wouldn't know what to do. 
There's so many. There's a saint for everything. You know what I mean? There's a saint for doctors. There's a saint for real estate owners. There's a, there's a saint for athletes. There's a saint for race car drivers, you know? Can you imagine going to heaven and finding out, you know, well, it's going to be about 10 days from now, I'm going to find out what patron saint I am. You know, I get a whole group of people that I'm going to kind of be over. And, uh, you know, you hear, oh, listen, he got, he's over surgeons over there. Isn't that fantastic? He's over surgeons. He's over kings and queens. He's the patron saint of kings and queens. Next in line, uh, Jude, Jude, come on over here. <laughs> See how Catholic you are. We got, we got a group for you. Hopeless causes. <laughs> Can you imagine what he thought at that point? I waited all this time. You gave me hopeless. For how long do I do that? Forever. <laughs> There's a saint for everything. And here's what I did. I put together my posse. The posse are the ones you walk with. The posse are the people that you get to know really well. And they are brothers and sisters who will help you with your life and your vocation. So, for example, I'll just tell you some of mine. And I suggest maybe five. And I have their medals. I read about them. I walk with them. When I got up this morning, I mentioned a couple of them. St. John Paul II is in my posse. Because I want to learn how to communicate better with the modern world. He was a real example. St. Joseph is in my posse because he can teach me and pray for me to be a better husband and a father. St. Augustine was a Bible scholar, and I'm constantly asking him to pray for me for insight as I study the Bible. I got a problem sometimes in that I love simplicity, but my life becomes complicated. St. Francis is in my posse. So I, I I have about six or seven in my posse, and and then I have a few that I bring out once in a while, like on a trip or something. I need them. I need their, These are the people that I walk with. I'm not alone. I am part of this amazing body of Christ. You understand what I'm saying there? So on the radio show, uh, on the show, I encourage people to develop a posse. Start praying and asking these people to pray for you and to be a better disciple. I'm getting so many emails from people around the world saying, here's my posse and why. Here's why I chose St. Therese. This is why I have Mother Teresa every day praying for me. This is beautiful rather than just, I got access to all the saints, but I don't do anything with any of them. It's intentional. It's intentional. So that's a beautiful thing. So uh, get a posse. Get a posse. And then finally, the last mark of a disciple is what I would call situational awareness. The situational awareness. Look for opportunities to be Christ on a daily basis. Everywhere you go, every person you meet, every circumstance you find yourself in is a possibility. You are not just a mere common person. C.S. Lewis said, you have never met a mere mortal. Every person is invaluable. And you are being used by Jesus. You are being used by Jesus to do the work that he started. And one of the great travesties of the modern era is that when people study the faith but completely disconnect from the head, I study Jesus, I study the saints, but I do not see myself connected. I am not the body of Christ. I am a student of the head. But the student of the head needs to be the body of the head, the body of Christ. So that means every room I go into, every room I go into, every room you go into has possibilities. Look around, read faces, listen to conversation. Look for opportunities to love, to be bold, to do things you've never done before. Last week, our family went on a cruise to Alaska, and uh, it was rough. We, we had a pontoon. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> a pontoon called Royal Caribbean. <laughs> We were on the boat uh, with all the grandkids and everything to Alaska for a family vacation. We were walking on the promenade. (laughs) And we're walking down, and my wife's with me. And and I looked over, 
situational awareness. I saw a man that was sitting there like this. And I looked at him and I walked on. My wife stopped me 10 feet later. She said, honey, because she knows situational awareness. She said, I think that man was crying. I said, I don't think he was. (laughs) Especially on the way to ice cream. (laughs) I said, "I, I don't think he was. She said, I think he was. And she said that because she knows I'll go back. Situational awareness. I don't know how many disciples were on the boat that day. I can tell you what, there were 1,600 Hare Krishnas. Seriously, as a Hare Krishna cruise. I, I didn't know that. Honestly, I didn't know that. I didn't. It was a weird experience. It was us and a bunch of Hare Krishnas. And so I, I said, okay, look, I have my back. He's praying. He's praying. And he was. He was praying. But if he was crying, I would have been sitting down next to him. Because I don't know how many Christians were on the boat, but I do know this. There was one disciple. There was a disciple on the boat. Now, I know that there were more because my wife was there, but I'm I'm a disciple. I've got to think of yourself as a disciple. We are not just Catholics. You know what I mean by that? I'm not putting Catholic down. I, I is one. But what I'm saying is, we're more than just a label. We're disciples of the Lord. Situational awareness. One of the things that I so enjoy is I I enjoy uh, competitive shooting, pistol shooting, rifle shooting. I enjoy it. I enjoy that. And one of the things they will teach you all the time is situational awareness. When you go into a room, what, what are the dangers? What are the opportunities? And in the spiritual life, you go into a room, you're driving to work, what are the potential dangers? What are, what's the situation like today? We've got to be aware of the opportunities, the dangers, and walk wisely as modern-day disciples because we are men and women on a mission, on a mission. So I'm going to close it up there because I want to give um, at least five minutes for questions. <laughs> so let's pray, and then let's pray, and then I will open it up for a, a few questions before we go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you for my brothers, my sisters who have come together. We all, Lord, want more of you. We're all learning together. We're all in great need of your wisdom and your forming in our life. Uh, Lord, help us to become truly modern-day disciples. Uh, Help us in all of these areas to take steps, uh, particularly, Lord, isolating disciplines in our life that, that we really need to work on over this next year. Help us to grow. Help us to know ourselves and our weaknesses so that we can walk in your strength. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Any questions that anyone might have? Any kind of a question? We've got a microphone here. There's a question right back there. So, so I really like your plan, um, and the best decision I made six years ago was to say I'm going to be a follower, not a leader anymore, of Christ, that is. Um, what about six years? I decided I was going to oh. follow instead oh, wonderful. of lead. Um, what about the whole idea of discerning? Of what? Discerning. Discerning? How do I know when it's my plan or God's plan? Dis- like making a decision during the day? about talking to someone or just in general? Well, discernment is really important. And discernment, the, the foundation of discernment is relationship, and it is truth. And the, the best thing we can do to be, to be good at discerning or having a good conscience that leads us, uh, the church really relies heavily on your conscience to guide you, but it, it prefaces that by saying a well-formed conscience. And a well-formed conscience is a conscience that is formed in the heart of the church with scripture, the catechism, um, the, teachings, the teachings of the church, uh, all of that. Uh, like when we, when we interpret scripture, we don't interpret scripture in a way that is contrary to what has already been revealed to us uh, by the church. So discerning is, is something that 
has to fit into the teachings of the church, the teaching of Scripture, but it also, I believe, should bring a peace to our life, you know? Uh, Paul says that, that we have a peace that passes all understanding. And when I'm discerning something in my life to do, I, I go by the peace of God. God, lead me and guide me. And what are my gifts and calling? Is this something that you called me to, that you have put in my heart? And does this benefit or does this hurt my family? Uh, is, this, is this something that Jeff would really like to do? But this is a step back for my kids. You know, I have to be aware of that. That's frankly why I'm not on EWTN anymore. I was on EWTN for six years. I was Mother Angelica's substitute for six years. And I left life on the rock and moved from Birmingham, Alabama, back to Minneapolis. Because one day when I was getting ready to fly to Birmingham to do the show which I knew I wasn't going to spend my whole life doing a show for young adults, that God wanted me to do the scripture studies, which the great adventure had not been developed at that point in terms of the Catholic uh, audience. And I got, I got uh, ready to go out into the garage one morning at about 7 to go to the airport, and my daughter, who was 3 at the time, came up to me with tears in her eyes, and she said, Daddy, and I said, Yes, sweetie. She said, she started crying. She said, Every time you go on that airplane, she said, It hurts right here. And I went, and so I knew that I needed to pray about that and discern, and uh, and I I uh, discerned that that's that, and then shortly after that, ended up creating the first Bible timeline, and that went make crazy, you know, in terms of parishes, and I knew I'd made the right decision, but it was my family, you know, at that at that point, so. And is it good for, good for my heart? So there's a lot of factors that go into discerning. There's a great book by Father Dubé called Certitude that talks about discernment. Father Dubé, Certitude. So, um, Oh, Certitude, sorry, and then he's got another one on spiritual direction, sorry. No, no, that's okay. Um, I, I may have missed this, but I, I would have said as I imitate Jesus, especially this group that you label uber-Catholics, many of us will be leaders. So one of the, uh, if I might have added to the seven, would be humility, that when Jesus taught the apostles how to lead, he knelt down and washed their disgusting feet. But I, I've had the, we had a young priest that was at our church for the last two years that uh, wasn't really a prolific speaker and, you know, he had a working knowledge of the Bible, but he was incredibly humble and, and a very loving man and when he left our church to go to a, a new location, uh, there were hundreds of people in line, and each person was talking about the incredible way that he wrote on their life and made them a stronger Catholic. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know if that would be fit into one of these seven or if that should be number eight. Sure. Uh, I had mentioned it in terms of virtue, the humility at the beginning of that, but it deserves its own category. The humility, you know, humility is basically a proper assessment of who you are in relationship to God and who you are in relationship to one another. You're not bigger, you're not smaller, you know who you are, and, and uh, in your, your humility, you're able to be taught. So I think it's very key, leadership in humility, being a servant, you know, that's very, a very good suggestion. Oh, sorry, go, we'll go back there first. Okay, so you gave four um, components of Lexio. I've never understood the difference between con- meditation, which you do first, and contemplation. Okay. I'm always... Let me show you real quick. Uh, uh, lexio means reading. You take a few minutes to read it a couple times, maybe four verses. You write down the words or the phrase that really pop out at you, okay? Then you move into meditatio, meditation. Meditation is entering that context, entering that story, seeing yourself there. It's very much imagination and being a part of it. And it's active, very active. Jesus, you're there with Jesus. What would Jesus do? What is he expecting of you? What are the benefits of this situation? You can go on and on. Then oratio is where you start talking to him. It's prayer. Lord, um, what are you saying in my life? Are you giving me this opportunity? Should I do that? Uh, He'll direct your mind. You might think about somebody that you need to talk to. 
to say I'm sorry or whatever it might be. Then contemplatio is contemplation. Contemplation is different than meditation in that contemplation is not so, so much something that you do, is a place you end up. It's like a husband and wife who've been working all day long with lexio, meditatio, and oratio, and at the end of the day, they're sitting on a bench overlooking a lake, holding hands, looking out, saying nothing. They're just enjoying the fruit of the day. And that's what contemplatio is. It's just meditating on what you have gained through this wonderful 20-minute period with the Lord, with a thankful heart. It's very much of a restful place between lovers, so I really like the idea of isolating virtues and working on one at a time. Um, and at the same time, I tend to do that. I tend to want to make myself perfect. I want to make myself holy. And I went to confession a few months ago and, and the, have this list. And the priest said, you do know that being Catholic isn't a self-improvement project, right? And... And so, and I know that, I know it's the Holy Spirit that changes me. I know it's only in surrender can I really change, can I really become loving and generous and gentle and kind. Um, so how do you balance that? Because I tend towards the, I'm going to do it myself, the prideful sort of, I'm going to make mm-hmm. myself good. Well, when you isolate a discipline and you begin to experience the change, Uh, Maybe I should preface it by saying that it isn't your strength that is going to change this thing. You, You have to go into it as if it all was dependent upon you, and you have to go into it with the attitude it's all dependent upon him, and that you're going to work with the energy that is in you, uh, all of that with it, with that is within you. You're going to give over to this to strive to become holy and that his grace is helping you uh, in that. I think we could all start off and say at the beginning, I know I can't do this myself. Otherwise, I would have done it, you know. But Lord, I need your help. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet you. I'm going to give every bit I can to this, to improving uh, who you created here. Uh, I don't use the word self-improvement in that. I think it's, to me, it's all becoming more like him. That's what it's all about. Uh, I'm not interested in me being uh, the best me or, or all of that. Yeah, I'm interested in becoming more like him. It's relationship. It's more becoming more like my, my father. And that's, relation, that's relationship. And it comes from being with, with him. You know, I've been with my dad for uh, uh, long, a long time. You know, I'm 34 years old now. So I... <laughs> been with him a long time and I find myself when I was growing up my dad would sit in a chair and he would he'd do this watching the evening news and he'd do this and I used to look at him thinking why do you do that you're so weird and now I find myself watching the evening news doing this thing and I was like my dad's inside of me get out get out you know and <laughs> And, uh, and it comes from being with him, that I become like him. And, uh, and there are things about my dad I want to become more like. And that's not me self-improving. It's me wanting to become more like a hero. And Jesus is, is Lord and King. I love to be more like him. So that when people come up to you and they say, you know, you remind me of someone. They've said that to you before, right? So you remind me of someone. They'll do that to me. They'll say, you know, Jeff, you remind me of someone. And I'll say, Jesus? And they'll go, no, no, it's some... Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm waiting for them to go, that's it. That's who you remind me of, Jesus. So becoming like Jesus is not a self-improvement program. It is a transformation program from the inside with our cooperation. Yep. Thank you, Mom. Are we done then? All right. Well, God bless you. And uh, we're going to be around. I'm going to be giving a talk. I'm going to give a talk tonight on suffering in the book of Acts. But I'm going to share some things tonight never shared before. Really cool. Really cool. I, it's really going to be a lot of fun, I think. Uh, and there's so, that's the neat thing about this conference. So many neat talks. So many good speakers. God bless you. We'll talk to you later.